Friday, June 28th. This is the news on PBCJ. I am Simone Absalom. Petrodrum, the state-owned oil refinery, could be in private hands in approximately two years if the government follows the recommendation by the Petrodrum Review Committee, the PRC, to divest the entity in a long-term lease arrangement. This was disclosed at a press conference at Jamaica House on Thursday to reveal the findings of the Petrojam Review Committee. PRC Chairman Christopher Zaka said the refinery should be leased. We are of the view that transfer of active management of the refinery and terminal to the private sector provides the only credible opportunity to improve the operating performance of both entities while also mitigating the operating and project execution risks to the government and people of Jamaica. If the transaction advisors are unable in their investigations and analysis of the market to determine sufficient interest in the option to lease, then the refinery, in our view, should be shut down and a terminal-only operation should be implemented. Mr. Zaka noted that the committee's analysis indicates that for the petrogen refinery to be commercially viable, its operating efficiencies must improve and investment of some 78 million US dollars is needed. The committee said an enterprise team should be established to chart the course for government's exit from the operational management of petrogen. The committee, in its report, further proposes that with the exception of price adjustments related to terminal fees, rack fees, and customs administration fee margin, no other price adjustments should be applied by Petrogem without the oversight of an independent authority. The enterprise team should, in our view, also engage a suitable transaction advisor such as the International Finance Corporation, the IFC, an arm of the World Bank, to assist in identifying a suitable lessor with an appropriate PPP transaction framework, that GOJ should immediately begin the process of establishing an appropriate regulatory framework for the petroleum industry, including oversight with a maximum price at the terminal rack that incorporates CIF costs, terminal fees, and taxes, but restricts or eliminates the use of other adjustments which are to be approved only by the nominated regulator. Prime Minister Andrew Holness made it clear that while the PRC's review has been considered, no decision has been taken regarding the refinery as of yet. He admits that the window to making a decision is closing. He also addressed concerns about possible job loss at the refinery. To the average man, the business decisions can sound scary, such as mothball the plant and just operate a terminal. And then the legitimate question, so what happens to the jobs and the people who are there? And it is the, the duty of the government to, even though these decisions may sound scary, to walk the public through it and to ensure that if there are to be changes, then no one comes out as a loser in the process of change. The PRC, which was set up last September to review the entity's operations, believes divestment is the only path to pursue if the refinery is to remain viable. Meanwhile, the public will have a say in how the government moves ahead with Petrodrum in the wake of the PRC report, which recommended, among other things, that transfer of the management of state-owned oil refinery to private sector. We oftentimes tend to forget in the public conversation that Petrodrum, more than anything else, is a business. And so we wanted to get a better understanding of the cold, hard facts as it relates to the operational efficiency and the business decisions that need to be taken. Prime Minister Andrew Holness noted that Cabinet has considered the report but has not yet come to any conclusions. There are 12 recommendations in the report. 
The Prime Minister, however, cautioned that public consultations will not be an unbounded period of engagement. The stakeholders, even though many of them would have had the opportunity to speak to the committee, might want to go public with their views as well. And then we gauge public opinion, engage the public in this conversation, and we make a decision. This is not an unbounded period of engagement. We have some critical um, timelines on these things. He said the situation is compounded by the Jamaica Public Service Company's ongoing shift from heavy fuel oil to liquefied natural gas. He said the next phase is for the Zaka report to be tabled in Parliament. Then members will reserve parliamentary time for it to be debated. Minister of Industry, Commerce, Agriculture and Fisheries, Audley Shaw, has called on the Food Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO, to provide a greater degree of funding through technical cooperation budgets for the sector. Funding, he said, could address challenges such as the invasion of exotic pests and diseases, as well as towards the employment of strategies to prevent the introduction and spread of the deadly Panama disease tropical race 4, TR4, of bananas and African swine fever in the Caribbean region. Speaking at the 41st session of the FAO conference in Rome, Italy on Monday, Shaw said that currently Jamaica faces major crisis, crisis, including the invasion of exotic pests and diseases which have been negatively impacting the nation's agricultural production. Chief Justice Brian Sykes says steps are being taken to assist defendants to embrace the plea bargaining arrangement, which will allow them to get as much as 50% reduction in their sentences if they plead guilty in court. Speaking at the Judiciary of Jamaica National Public Education Symposium on Wednesday at the Trelawney Parish Court in Falmouth, Justice Sykes indicating that the offer was not designed to get innocent people to plead guilty said that the initiative, which was first outlined by Justice Minister Delroy Chuck, was a reasonable offer in helping to dispense justice in a timely fashion. Two government MPs have expressed their desire to have the newly rehabilitated Maxfield Ferris Road in Westmoreland renamed in honour of Jamaica's first native Governor General, Sir Clifford Campbell. Debate on a private member's motion to that effect was opened by the mover, Member of Parliament for St. James Central, Heroy Clark, in the House of Representatives on Tuesday. The motion also received the support of Attorney General and MP for St. James West Central, Marlene Malahu Ford. However, the debate was suspended to allow other MPs to contribute next week. And whereas Sir Clifford was also fellow of the Royal Commonwealth Society, President of Jamaica Flying Club, the Jamaica National Choral Orchestral Society, the Jamaica Youth Club Council, President and Grand Patron of the Jamaica Legion and Patron of such organization as the Boys Town Football Club, the Jamaica Agricultural Society, the Jamaica Football Federation, and the Jamaica Cancer Society. Be it resolved that the rehabilitated roadway from Maxfield to Ferris in Westmoreland fittingly be renamed the Sir Clifford Campbell Highway in honor of, a Westmoreland, of Westmoreland most honorable and decorated son. I stand to support this resolution wholeheartedly. Mr. Speaker, among other things, I'm delighted that the roadway in question from Maxfield to Ferris is being rehabilitated and will bring such relief to the people who commute um, between St. James and Westmoreland, Montego Bay and Savlamar, and those who use it regularly. Mr. Speaker, I believe it would be a most fitting honor to name the road um, as, as, as part of our respect to Sir Clifford Campbell, a distinguished son of Westmoreland. And uh, Mr. Speaker, it is my hope that the resolution will receive the support of all members of this House. Clark noted that Sir Clifford was elected Speaker of the House of Representatives in 1950 and later became President of the Senate, making him the only political representative to hold the positions. 
1962, after Jamaica gained independence, he was appointed the first black and Jamaican-born Governor General. News that two of the top international fast food franchises operating in Jamaica, Burger King and KFC, could set up shop in the planned Morant Bay Urban Center received the loudest cheers from several of the residents of St. Thomas who traveled to the Old Goodyear factory for the groundbreaking on Wednesday. St. Thomas is one of, if not the only parish in Jamaica not to have an outlet operated by Restaurant Associates Limited, Burger King, or Restaurants of Jamaica, KFC. And the residents were overjoyed to hear this could change when the urban center opens in a planned two years. In addressing the groundbreaking ceremony, Prime Minister Andrew Holness argued that the absence of the two big players in the local fast food sector was seen as a sign of a lack of development in St. Thomas. One of the requests that was made, I re distinctly recall, someone in the audience said, Prime Minister, you know that every other town have a Kentucky Fried Chicken. Well, I'm not here to promote any brand, right? but <laughs> I'm using that to make the point. People have certain markers for development and modernity. And essentially, the, what the person was asking was, you know, when will the services and amenities and facilities that are available in other developed areas, when will they be available here? This development will give the opportunity for enterprising business persons and I, I you know I would say to the business community get in right now get in before the buildings are built when completed the Morant Bay Urban Center project will have a rentable building space of 365,000 square feet it is slated to house the St. Thomas Municipal Council St. Thomas Parish Court Tax Administration Revenue Center, an Office of the Passport Immigration and Citizenship Agency, and a branch of the National Insurance Fund. It was like a counteraction of sorts. Incumbent People's National Party President Dr. Peter Phillips entering the stage at Court Law Auditorium in New Kingston Thursday night to the tune of Sizzler's Solid as a Rock. Just over two weeks ago, his impending challenger, Peter Bunting, turned up at the May Day High School in Manchester to the beat of Connix's Here Comes Trouble. Bunting had announced that he would be going up against Phillips for the presidency of the 81-year-old party at the upcoming annual conference. But on Thursday night, opposition Senator Donna Scott Motley emphatically declared, quote, there is only one Peter, and that is the first Peter. She was among a series of senators and other politicians who would take the stage to endorse Phillips' candidacy, including Katie Knight, Damian Crawford, Dwayne Vaz, Wickham McNeil, Philip Paulwell, Natalie Nita, Shane Alexis, and others. A film based on the life of pioneer Jamaican nurse Mary Seacole is in the works. According to Variety magazine, Seacole, which is being produced by new American production company Racing Green Pictures, stars English actors Gugu Mantha Raw and Sam Worthington. It has a release date of 2020. Seacole, born Mary Joan Grant in Kingston, rose to popularity and heroism through her work in Jamaica as a nurse during the cholera and yellow fever outbreaks. She often worked with British soldiers on the island and throughout the Caribbean. After learning about the Crimean War in 1853 through to 1856, she worked in that region with other nurses in British camps. Mary Seacole died in London on May 14, 1881 at age 75. Seacole was posthumously awarded the Order of Merit in 1991 by the Jamaican government. In 2004, she was voted the greatest black Briton. Get your taste buds in gear as we make the latest stop on Culinary Trails. 
cruise past all the hustle and bustle and make your way to F&B restaurant. It's a great spot for a date, a business lunch, or even an early dinner. F&B restaurant serves up delicious local dishes with great presentation. The multi-themed restaurant serves up cool drinks at the bar and stimulating art pieces. Pretty swanky. Wow. Yeah. Let's get talking. What are you guys gonna have to drink? Mm. Mm. Some wine. Okay. Yes, yes, let's get some wine. stands for food and beverage so this part is the restaurant we have Swiss stores where is the jewelry and we have the queue section that's a private section which we're gonna have lunch later so I will show you that space so right so this is a nice experience for shop and drink and dine Having a oxtail with rice and peas, then we have in a chicken salad, stir fry noodles with chicken, Alfredo pasta chicken, and a pepper pot. Good food, warm ambiance, interesting art displays, and exquisite jewelry. F&B Restaurant is a good choice when in Kingston. Thanks for watching Culinary Trails. The US dollar on Thursday, June 27, ended trading at Jamaican $131.10, down by 28 cents. That's according to the Bank of Jamaica's daily foreign exchange trading summary. The Canadian dollar in the trading at Jamaican $101.40, up from $100.35, while the British pound sterling in the trading at $165.95, down from $166 Jamaican 40 cents. In regional news, Guyana's opposition leader, Brad Jagdeo, says he won't rule out the possibility of looking outside the country for a new head of the Guyana Election Commission, GCOM. Jagdeo noted that the Guyana constitution allows for citizens of any Commonwealth nation to be among the nominees. The search for a new chairman became necessary following the resignation of former head of retired Justice James Patterson on Monday, after the Caribbean Court of Justice ruled that the process to elect Mr. Patterson was flawed and unconstitutional. Hoping 
to meet with the president, particularly on this matter. And uh, we're, we have, we're, ho we're hoping that he, will, he would have had the 18 names and that he is prepared to, to say if any of the 18 names are acceptable. And we are, we've, been, we've started the process of soliciting new names, just in case. And we are prepared to explore bringing names from outside of Ghana, because as far as we look, um, they, you can submit names from the Commonwealth, from people from the Commonwealth. So we are, we are prepared to engage, as I said, on a one-on-one -on -one um, and continuously until we resolve this matter. Earlier this week, Jack Dio had written to President David Granger proposing a meeting to discuss nominees for a new GCOM chairman. However, he said thus far he has yet to receive a reply from the president. We get more in this Newsroom Guyana report. The letter signed by Opposition Chief Whip Gail Teixeira was addressed to Director of the Ministry of the Presidency, Joseph Harmon, and was released to the media on Tuesday night by the Office of the Opposition Leader. The letter came one day after former GCOM Chair Justice retired James Patterson was forced to leave the elections body after the Caribbean Court of Justice ruled that the process for his appointment was flawed. The retired judge was unilaterally appointed by the President in 2017 after he rejected 18 names submitted by the opposition leader in accordance with the Constitution of Guyana. President of the CCJ Justice Adrian Saunders delivering his ruling on June 18th suggested that the President and Opposition Leader meet and deliberate on the names before they are submitted. On Wednesday, Kemar Ramjatan, leader of the Alliance for Change, the smaller faction of the coalition government, said he supports that recommendation made by the CCJ. He says they must, and he bold the word must, that they must meet and work out the six names together and then once it is acceptable to the president the president then selects one of the six i think that is extraordinarily a progressive move and so that should be abided by the president last week sent a letter to the opposition leader inviting him to a meeting to discuss the current political situation the CCJ gave both sides until July 1st to present written submissions on what consequential orders should be taken. On July 12th, the court will issue those orders on the way forward. Dominica's Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt has invited three overseas organizations to launch a joint mission on the issue of electoral reform. With general elections due next year, there has been repeated calls for electoral reform. However, the three main political parties in the country have been at odds on the way forward. In a statement on Wednesday, Skerritt said representatives from CARICOM, the Commonwealth Secretariat, and the Organization of American States, the OAS, will be meeting with the government and other stakeholders. I have asked them to make recommendations on the best way to implement the reforms to introduce identification cards for the purpose of voting and to revise the register of electors to ensure that the confidence of the general public can be reposed in the decisions taken to move the electoral process forward. I have received a favorable response from all three organizations and I expect in the coming weeks that their representatives will be on island to undertake this mission. This is a continued expression of the government's efforts to ensure that on a sensitive matter like this, that there is complete transparency and that every opportunity is given to the public to discuss the issues in a mature and rational manner. Skerritt acknowledged that over the past few months, the public has been bombarded by half-truths and misinformation from sources that want to frustrate the process of electoral reform. We accept that our system can be improved. And this is why this government, since 2013, has been working towards the implementation of recommended reforms to make it mandatory to use identification cards for voting and to ensure that we can have a more accurate 
register of electors. All of the requirements set out and the funding requested by the Electoral Commission have been made available to it in a timely manner. The Commission has indicated to the public since 2016 that all it requires in order to move forward is the legislative authority. The attempts to bring this legislation to Parliament has been resisted by some who fail to realize and appreciate that this legislation achieves the very thing that they claim to want. In sports, we are on the pitch with cricket as West Indies' hopes of advancing in the Cricket World Cup were dashed on Thursday after they were crushed 125 runs by India, who continue an unbeaten rump in the competition. Here are the highlights. Holy top scoring with a man of the match 72 and former skipper MS Dhoni getting an unbeaten 56. Seema Kimara Roach was outstanding, finishing with 3 for 36 from his 10 overs, while captain Jason Holder and fellow pacer Sheldon Cottrell claimed two wickets apiece. That's the first six for Rohit Sharma. That's beautifully bold. It's the perfect length. And they reviewed it. Yeah, I've got conclusive evidence. So I'm going to get Richard to reverse your decision from not out to out. Well, Rohit Sharma and KL Rahul cannot believe it. They've thrown the head in the air. Well done. This is absolutely brilliant. There will be runs and runs in style against Jason Holder. It's a lovely shot from Kale Rao, Risty but down the ground. Now then, he's gone through, he's not going to get the 50 but 48. A decent contribution, Jason Holder caps off a good spell with a wicket. Top edge, and that finds the fence. It's a good delivery to Virat Kohli. Outside edge, and he strikes! A very good delivery to Vijay Shankar. And a much needed breakthrough for the West Indies. Well, you get the 50 now. His fourth 50 in a row, fourth World Cup 50 in a row. It's gone a long way up, but not far enough, I don't think. Easily taken. Did I say three wickets down? Make it four. And straight into the hands of covers. Another soft dismissal. Outside edge. And that's what Virat Kohli wanted. A good catch by MS Dhoni. He hasn't had a great day behind the stumps. But the experienced campaigner hangs on to this one. An appeal. Yes, he does again. When the ball gets old, bring back Jasprit Bumrah. Oh, taken. Just a bit of room, Shimran Hetmeyer. Oh, there he goes again. He's got loads of bat on this. Oh, how number 10 would enjoy that shot. Oh, now that'll be out there. It's a game of chess, isn't it? It's something Child was very good at when he was a child. What's that gone off? He's claiming it. He's claiming it. There's a review left. Uh, Richard got conclusive evidence uh, that the ball has come off the glove. Going to get you to reverse your decision from now to out. India march on. Chris Gale on Wednesday revealed he was delaying his retirement after previously stating the World Cup would be his final one-day international tournament. The 39-year-old said in February that he would quit ODIs after the showpiece in England and Wales, although he later prevaricated. Now he appears to be setting his sights on India's tour of the West Indies later this year as a potential swan song and is even considering playing in the test for the first time in five years. 
West Indies host India for two tests, three ODIs and three 2020 internationals in August and September. In athletics, sprinter Kemar Bailey Cole has parted ways with Racers Track Club head coach Glenn Mills and is to begin training with his former coach, Gregory Little, who is also of the Racers Track Club. Bailey Cole in a statement said that Little was responsible for his progression as an athlete with steady sub-10 clockings on the circuit from the start of his career in 2010 until the start of 2014. The change is to take effect immediately. Bailey Cole noted that his last five seasons have been under the tutelage of Mills, whom he thanked for his work to date. And that's the news on PBCJ. Thanks so much for watching.